You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. I like to think that I've learned so much from, from all my friends, you know, both in the bird hunting community and the big game. And it's really, you know, helped me to be the hunter that I am today and something that I can now pass on to other people. You know, I enjoy taking people out and teaching them um, how to hunt and things of that sort. And, and I will forever tell everybody, like, to pass this, to pass our hunting heritage on to people, you have to be a mentor. You have to teach these people because think about it. When you first started hunting, did you know how to do anything? No, you know, it's not showing you the ropes, just like a coach or you know, things of that sort. And so I'm just forever thankful. And now I, you know, have the knowledge and I feel confident going out by myself and, and doing that and, you know, sharing things with young people who come to me who want to go hunting. Hey, bird dog babes. My name is Courtney Bastion, and I am obsessed with all things bird dogs. And I'm here with you to share the stories, experiences, knowledge, and opinions from the women and a few guys in the industry that are killing it. I'm a Wisconsin girl living in a Montana world. I'm mom and two incredible kiddos, wife and occasional assistant to a pro gun dog trainer, traveling the U.S. talking about canine nutrition while hunting, breeding, and competing with my German wire hair pointers and Bracco Italianos. As someone who started hunting later in life because I wanted to give my dogs the opportunity to do what they were bred to do, I'm here to help inspire, educate, and connect women to get their bird dogs out in the field and experience a bond like no other. So pour yourself a glass of wine and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Bird Dog Babe Podcast. So this past Saturday, we held a Women, Wine, and Wild Game event at Excel Shooting Sports in Kalispell, Montana. It was by far one of the most fun and rewarding events I've ever been involved with. Every single lady that went hunting saw the magic of bird dogs doing what they were bred to do. I'm grateful for the Big Sky NAVDA chapter members that brought their dogs out and helped plant birds each brace. The dogs were studied to wing, shot, and fall, which not only made for a safe experience, but also a successful one. Because the dog's trainability allowed for women to be ready and mounted when the birds got up. And every single one of them shot at least one bird. They ranged from novice to experience, and for several, it was their first time shooting a bird. They then took their harvested birds to the bird cleaning station, where they were taught different methods, then, the amazing Hannah Nickenau not only provided great food, but also did a live demo of preparing a delicious pheasant piccata recipe. Amazing stuff there, folks, and these ladies are all stoked to get out bird hunting this season. I'm extremely grateful to my partner in crime, Tracy Keenitz, owner of Excel Shooting Sports, on this crazy idea we put together and brought to life. She spent the majority of the day helping ladies learn about proper gun fit and how to increase their success in shooting. I've described the day as magical, and it truly was. So stay tuned for some future events that Tracy and I have started to brew. Holy cow, this is episode 20, Where Has Time Gone? My guest today is Callie Parmley, the Gundog Magazine Editor-in-Chief. Kelly is a DIY hunt enthusiast and first female editor of the Gundog magazine. In the past year and a half at this position, Kelly has made some awesome improvements to the magazine. This is an absolute go-to for all things dog training and upland hunting. And I totally took advantage of the fact that Kelly not only gets all the good juice on gear, but she's one that really gets after it and puts it to the test. So I was anxious to learn what she loves. Okay, let's get after it. Thank you to sponsor Dakota 283, unparalleled protection for traveling to and from your favorite hunting spot. Dakota 283 kennels are a premium quality roto mold with recessed handles on top for convenient and safe tie down and makes it easy to lift up into the truck. I love the secure door frame with high security locks so I know my dogs are safe when I need to stop for fuel. An added bonus is the drain hole in the back, which makes cleaning a breeze when your dog has been run hard and put away wet. Head over to dakota283.com and use promo code BIRDDOGBABE for a 10% discount. Thanks to sponsor Excel Shooting Sports. 
elite dealer of Cesar Guarini, Bab Arm, and Siren shotguns. Siren is the world's only full line of shotguns created for the female competitor, hunter, and shotgun enthusiast. Excel is one of only four demo centers west of the Mississippi. They give you the opportunity to actually try out a gun before you walk out the door with it. As an elite dealer for Cesar Guarini, Excel offers their customers unlimited pit stops of free service and tune-ups on all shotguns, a great way to have your gun in top condition for the upcoming hunting or target season. In addition, they're offering an exclusive deal to all of the Bird Dog Babe listeners for a free gun slip with each purchase, a $90 value. Hey, Callie. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Courtney. Thanks for having me. I know that you're busy with a lot of things going on there, especially your new puppy. Yeah, he's (laughs) laying in the background right now, doing things he's not supposed to do. (laughs) Of course. That's that's just what they do, right? (laughs) Yeah, I've got Lincoln laying sleeping beside me, grouchy, because the puppy's running around, pouncing on him and doing things he's not supposed to. So (laughs) right before we got on, we had a... A little incident where, you know, the old man let the puppy know what he wasn't supposed to do. And so I'm glad that we weren't recording then because you'd hear. <laughs> <laughs> how is, how is he adjusting with the new puppy in the house? He's fine. He's had puppies around. He just, um, you know, he's been by himself for almost seven years. So he's figuring it out and he's, he's a little grumpy and I can definitely tell he's a lot more cuddly because he wants you know my attention and so I'm trying to give it to him and that's fine and just get him as comfortable as possible because he was the first one in the house so yeah Uh, he'll warm up to the puppy he always does after a couple weeks so he'll be all right yeah and it sounds like he's got you know the, the perfect temperament for that too because some of the older dogs they either just lay over and let the puppy you know take over that role yeah or else they're too harsh with correction but the fact no, that he's, he's just fine. I think he'll be okay he um he definitely puts him in his place when he's supposed to and then he also just kind of ignores him for now but he's also really good with him so we've only had a couple incidents where you know Lincoln's trying to sleep and Jones is crawling all over him and he lets him know that that's not okay you know so <laughs> So I want to talk to you about your position as editor in chief of Gundog Magazine because you've been in that position for is it is it a year now? Yeah, it's oh, it's probably closer to two now, over a year and a half. So okay, all right, cool. Before we get into that, Kelly, um, take me back and tell me a kind of a little bit about your story and how you got into hunting. I actually didn't grow up hunting, but I grew up in a very rural community in a small town in Ohio. And so, uh, you know, I grew up, my school was in cornfields. So hunting wasn't weird to me. And I was very, I was, you know, I lived on a farm and I had horses and I was camping and a trail riding and all those things. So I was very into the outdoors. And um, my grandpa actually raised English setters for field trialing after he retired and so I was really exposed to bird dogs back then, but again, never really was into it. Uh, and I didn't get into hunting until I graduated from college. And my first job out of college was with a group called um, the U.S. Sportsman's Alliance. And they're a nonprofit that essentially, you know, fights anti-hunting legislation. And so I took a job with them as uh, their youth program. I worked in their youth program to teach kids how to, you know, get outdoors and shoot guns and things of that sort. And there was a friend there named Jeremy uh, who asked me one day if I wanted to go turkey hunting. And I was like, yeah, sure, you know. And so he took me turkey hunting and it was a very memorable experience, so much so that I had so much fun that it made me really get hooked into it and get into really hunting. And that's when I really got into it to start with. And from there, the rest is kind of history. I, um, um, I, I got Lincoln, not as a bird dog, just as a, you know, a lab, a house dog. And it turns out that he just had all natural hunting instincts. I had a friend ask me to bring Lincoln one time um, to a training day where they were going to a game farm to work with their dogs. And I kind of laughed and said, no, no, he's, you know, he's got basic obedience, but he's never hunted before. I don't want to ruin your, ruin your day. And he encouraged <laughs> me to bring him. And it was funny because within three hours of Lincoln watching the other dogs and what they were doing 
he picked up on it and he, by the end of the day, he had like flushed and retrieved three birds or something oh, nice. like that. And so I was just, you know, of course, almost in tears because it was just so right. cool to see my dog do that. And um, from there, I knew that it was, it would be terrible if I didn't train him for hunting. And so I like to say that uh, Lincoln is really what made me a bird hunter because between me figuring out how to train him just by reading books and watching YouTube videos and then us working together, that's really how we became bird hunters. And so I like to give Lincoln all the credit for for helping me really come into this sport. And so um, that's how I got into bird hunting. But, and then I had a couple of friends who helped mentor me and we did a bunch of cool trips and we really figured it out. And that's how I really, um, I really fell in love with uh, cross country wild bird hunting. And then uh, on top of that, after I was with USA for a while, I knew I'd always known that I wanted to be a magazine editor. I didn't know it'd be in the hunting world, but I always knew that's what I wanted to do. A job opened up at Peterson's Hunting as the associate editor, and I was fortunate enough to be given that position. And that's how I got into big game hunting because I took that job with Peterson's, and um, I had another friend who took me on a backcountry bear hunt. Who I'd always been a backpacker. I'd always really enjoyed backpacking. And so then when he asked me to go to Idaho to do this fly in bear camp where we'd backpack for a few days and hunt bears, I was like, yep, count me in. And that's when I really got hooked on DIY backcountry hunting. And ever since then, the rest is this kind of history. And it's just now I live and breathe hunting. That's all I really do, that's all I care about. <laughs> you know, camping, yeah. hunting, backpacking, hunting over my dogs and things of that sort. And so, um, I recently moved to Utah just so I could be closer to do those things. And where were you before? Um, I'm from Ohio, but I lived in Illinois for the job. And so okay. I was living in Peoria, Illinois for the past four years, which I loved, you know, that's Midwest is my home will always be my home. Mm -hmm. But I was finding, you know, I had to drive 20 hours and I had to plan, you know, my trips where I could hunt multiple species and live out of my car for two weeks. And, you know, and so when they finally told me that I could work remotely, I was like, well, it's either move home to Ohio, which don't get me wrong, I love, or try living out west for a little bit where you can just hunt out your back door right. instead of having to drive a long time to get there. So that's what I did. And I'm giving it a try and I'm loving it so far. And how long have you been in Utah? I just moved in January. So. Okay. Oh, nice. I'm getting excited. I've just, I'm you know, now the hunting season's coming up here and I've got a whole bunch of stuff planned and I don't have to strategically <laughs> sit down and think about, okay, you're going to camp here. You're going to, you need to pack this. You need to camp here. You're going to be gone this long, you know? So it's, it's right. really kind of a breath of fresh air. I'm sure. So how much of your planning when you were moving and looking at different locations, um, like why did you decide on Utah and, and where you are in Utah? So I'll be honest and say, um, I moved to Illinois without knowing anybody. And, you know, as an adult, it's really hard to make friends. And so I always told myself the next place I moved, I want to make sure I at least know a few people there. That'll mm -hmm. make things easier. You know, they can introduce you to things. You can help make new friends. And so um, I love Idaho. I hunt Idaho almost every year and I love it there, but I didn't know anybody. And I, you know, I didn't really want to move to Colorado because again, I don't know anybody. So Salt Lake City, I have, I had some friends here who I already knew and um, they were encouraging me, telling me how cool the city was. And so it was last year I was out here hunting again, one of my big road trips. I, um, I drove out and I dropped Lincoln off with a friend here in Salt Lake City because I was going to go hunt elk in Idaho. And when I was done hunting elk, I came back to Salt Lake to get him. And then I was going to go back to Idaho to bird hunt. And in between that time, my friend, I had a couple days and she was just showing me around and showing me all the cool things here in, you know, around Utah. And it was just like, yep, that's it. That's where I need to live. And so <laughs> that's why I chose it. And it's, you know, it's a hub. It's easy to get here. Yeah. It's close to everywhere where I hunt. You know, I can be in Idaho in three hours. I can be in Nebraska in six or, you know, right. in, in this Colorado. Like it's just, it's a really cool central location. Yeah. I spend a lot of time in Salt Lake City, but it's always just in the airport. <laughs> right. But, you know, I can, I can hunt chucker right out my door. You know, I can be right. in 20 minutes. I can hunt grouse. I can hunt elk and, you know, mule deer. And, and so I'm just going to give it a try for a while. And right now I'm loving it. So yeah. Have you been scouting out different areas that you're going to be going this fall? 
Yeah, I've got, luckily, I'm, you know, people here are really nice. <laughs> and so they've uh, given me some insight into where to go chase birds. And then um, uh, been, I know where I'm going to go for elk. Me and my buddy are going to go bow hunt elk here in late, uh, early September. And then um, other than that, it's just going to be, a, you know, me just figuring out on, on my own. And that's kind of half of what I love is just going in for the weekend and grabbing a backpack and just going off the grid with the dogs for a little bit. Like, that's cool. And there's right. so many cool places here that it's, you can, you can, like last weekend I was up in the Uintas camping next to a lake and it's just, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, this is elk are here. You know, there's going to be elk up here. There's going to be grouse up here. You know, we we're close to, you know, 9,000 feet and it's just like, this is awesome. So, um, part of the whole moving out here is just, um, finding cool places to go. And I just really enjoyed doing that. And my friends, you know, always say like, where do you want to camp this weekend? And I just get on Onyx and just start looking. I'm like, well, this looks really cool. And so I just, I really enjoy that part of it all. That's perfect. And Kelly, you identify yourself as a DIY hunter. Can you define that for us of what that is? Yeah, that's just, you know, part of um, what I was saying before. I just, I really enjoy do it yourself hunts where um, you find the spots you find the places to go and camp, you score over maps for months at a time, trying to figure out where you think good locations are and, and you just plan your whole hunt that way. And I just think that's um, super fun just to be able to say, I did, you know, this is, this is what we're going to do this weekend. This is where we're going to go. And, and whether you see animals or not, that's not part of it. You know, the part of it is just that you're out there enjoying it and you're trying to figure out, uh, where you can tag out on, where you can find birds, where you can find elk, things of that sort. And I just think that's really part of the whole experience of hunting. And that's really kind of what drew me to it too, is that it's all about just being out there and doing it. And, you know, whether that be by yourself or with a couple of friends or, or, you know, it, that's just part of the whole experience. And that's part of really why I enjoy hunting and backpacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in Illinois, you know, I, yeah, I was, I'm from Wisconsin. So Mm -hmm. deer hunting there is just so much different. You're up in a tree stand, you're waiting for them to cross, you know, underneath of you. And out here, I've just recently learned the concept of glassing and it's just such a different type of hunt. It is. And there's, and there's, yeah. you know, there's something to be said, um, for all types of, you know, hunting, whether you're hunting in the Midwest or the West, but it is, it's a different type of hunting. It's, it's a lot of hiking, a lot of glassing, but um, you know, whether you're in the Midwest doing your own whitetail and, you know, setting up stands, you know, doing food plots and, and things of that mm -hmm. sort, like that itself is um, something to be said and really awesome. Absolutely. And when you pour on that, you know, big buck, that's like, you know, I did this, I did this. And, and same when you're out in the West, it's, um, you know, I found this trail, I found, you know, this you know, mountain range that I think you're going to hold animals and then you end up seeing them. And even if you don't tag out, it's still, <laughs> something to be said for that, you know, and even just glassing up a mule deer or an elk, it's just, it's really exhilarating. And it's something um, that I really look forward to every year. So what was kind of the process in how you learned to do all that? You know, you said you had, you went out with a friend and so how did you know, did you learn all that just from going with so I learned, so I had, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of good mentors in my life who taught me, you know, what they've learned over the years and shared their experience with me and, um, uh, you know, showed me how to score over maps and, and figure out what's good and what's not and figure out, you know, um, well, you can't, you can't backpack without water. You can't, you know, you can't go here and here's how you find a trail. Here's how you, um, here's what a map is telling you. And so I was very fortunate in that. And I, I, um, I'm forever thankful because that's really how I gained my knowledge. And then I also gained knowledge just by, I, you know, through Peterson's going on guided hunts and just watching the guides and having them explain to me what they're doing, what they're looking for, um, how to pick apart landscapes for, you know, while you're glassing and, you know, my good, I had, you know, a good buddy, James, and he's taught me, you know, here's what we need to do. Here's what you're going to look for when we're hunting elk. Here's how to sit behind glass and, you know, taught me little tricks of the trade that you wouldn't know unless you had someone teach you, you know, little mm -hmm. things like mount your binos on a tripod because you're going to be sitting there all day, you know, things like that. And I'm just forever thankful for it. And I like to like to think that I've learned so much from, from all my friends, you know, both in the bird hunting community and the big game and, 
it's really, you know, helped me to be the hunter that I am today and something that I can now pass on to other people. You know, I enjoy taking people out and teaching them um, how to hunt and things of that sort. And, and I will forever tell everybody like to pass this, to pass our hunting heritage on to people, you have to be a mentor. You have to teach these people because think about it. When you first started hunting, did you know how to do anything? No, you know, it takes no. someone showing you the ropes, just like a coach or right. you know, things of that sort. And so I'm just forever thankful. And now I, you know, have the knowledge and I feel confident going out by myself and, and doing that and, you know, sharing things with young people who come to me who want to go hunting. Right. So what is one of your biggest tips for novice DIY hunters? Uh, biggest tips is don't go too big too early. You know, a lot of people get in their mind. I wrote an article the other day for the, the other magazine that I put together called Backcountry Hunter about um, backpack hunting. And, you know, a lot of people go in with this thought, I'm going to hike in 10 miles and I'm going to shoot a big deer and, and hike out. And it's like, why don't you start small? Because I always, um, I always joke, I camp and I backpack a lot and it's not really that enjoyable. <laughs> you know, it's, it's enjoyable because it's a mental thing. It's, it's, um, a mind over matter. That's what I like to say, but you know, putting all this stuff on your back and then going, you know, hiking five miles and living out of a backpack, you don't sleep good. You know, you're not really making great meals. And so, right. you know, people have these big dreams and they see all this stuff online about these people backpacking and doing these awesome hunts. I'm like, start small, um, go for a one night backpacking trip, not hunting, just do it and see, and make sure you test all your gear, make sure you, uh, know how to, everything works and understand that you're going to have like 50 pounds on your back and you're about to hike in the mountains. It's not as easy as it looks. And so I always laugh when people have these big dreams. I'm like, let's just start small, do a one nighter, do a two nighter, you do a glad, you know, do a scouting trip. So that before you go in and you have this huge elk trip planned, you need to go in and do it over the summer so that you get practice because you don't want to ruin your the tag you've been looking forward to all year by never having gone backpacking before. Mm -hmm. Does that make yeah. sense? Oh yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's a huge learning curve. And I think, um, you know, just having that, a list down of gear I'm going to need to take. And, yeah, and they get, you know, people think, well, I remember one time I was with a buddy, uh, Brian, we were, we were, I think we were, we were, I think it was when I was doing an elk hunt and he was coming along and doing a bird hunt and um, he was going to hunt birds while I hunted elk. And I think we ran into these kids who their packs I had to have weighed 90 pounds, had to have weighed 90 pounds. And they were um, from Michigan. And so, you know, they never dealt with elevation, nothing. And they were telling us how they were going to go in and, and backpack 10 miles in and hunt elk and blah, blah. And we just kind of, you know, we, we said, you know, have fun, congrats. And we just looked at each other like they've never done this before. And they clearly have never backpacked because when you're backpacking, you don't carry 90 pounds going in, you know, right. <laughs> so right. it's just, you know, dream, you, the people are dreaming big and whatever, but my advice to everyone is start small, mm -hmm. uh, and find someone who can help you, who's done it before so that they can give you tips and tricks on, um, on, you know, how to pack a pack and things of that sort, you know, between my buddy, uh, David Fabian, he's the one who first took me um, on, we did a backcountry bear hunt together. I had backpacked before, but, and I knew tips of my own, but there was little things that he shared with me that I still to this day use, you know, breaking down my backpacking meals into Ziploc baggies. So it's not big and bulky and things of that sort. And so you just learn from different people, learn different things and you share different tidbits with each other that really can make you a better hunter in the end. Kelly, how many different packs do you have? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I probably have, I probably have five different packs, but there's always one that I always go to. So my go-to. Okay. Yeah. And of course it depends on how, how long and off the grid I'm going to, but I like my Kuyu pack and, um, I think it's 3,200 or 3,700 and it's good for three to five days. Off wow. Grid. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, if you and, pack very, you got to pack very strategically, but, and then, but yeah. if I'm home with the dogs now, if I'm being honest, I'm back, if I'm backpacking with Lincoln, well, soon to be Jones too, Lincoln's got to carry his own stuff. Cause I can't fit it in my pack. So Lincoln's got his own pack and does um, he really? Oh yeah. He has to, I can't carry. He's, he's yeah. That's awesome. Does he carry him. his own, does he carry his own dog food? 
He carries his own dog food. He carries his own water. Um, he carries his own sleeping pad and blanket. And That's your dog awesome. can carry uh, 25% of their weight. And Lincoln's a big lab. He's a big muscular lab. So he can carry a lot. And um, because I can't fit it all in there. You know, between dog food is heavy, water is heavy. And so yeah. I make him carry his own stuff. Yeah. What kind of pack do you have on Lincoln? Uh, I have a uh, rough wear. Okay. It's, um, I forget what name it is. It's a red one, but it's a really nice one because the bags can come off of the harness if you need it to be like one time I was, um, hiking in, uh, Southern Utah and we kind of got one of those slot canyons and he was going through and couldn't really fit. So I had to take the bags off of the, um, off of the harness and carry them for him for a little ways, but it's a really nice pack and it's big and it carries, uh, a lot of food and gear. And it also has these water bottles that go in it too, to carry water in. So that's really nice. That is. And I've been talking to my friend Hannah about this, this pack stuff lately, because I'm intrigued with, you know, what, what I should be getting. And there are so many different kinds. And she was, I had sent one to her and she said, oh, you're going to need one. That's at least, I think she said 35 liters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, And yeah. So, I mean, what, what size is your go-to pack? So, um, if you, it depends on how long you're going off the grid. It, um, okay. it, it depends on, hang on, let me, I just wrote an article about this. And um, I'm totally going to start small, like you suggested. So, <laughs> yeah, so it really depends on how many days you're going off the grid. And I like to okay. tell people, um, it's okay to have a bigger pack than what you really need, but what's not okay is to pack it with stuff that you don't really need. And mm. so, um, uh, I have, I think I have the 3,200, like I said, and that, and, you know, some packs do either by cubic inches or by liters. And so, mm -hmm. um, understanding, I'm trying to find an article here that I just wrote. You have to edit this is out. it, is that one published yet? Yeah. So it's out in okay. the Hunter magazine, the spring issue. Okay. And it's just talking about, you know, the basics of uh, backpacking and, and how to start and what kind of pack you need and things of that awesome. sort. So, how um, perfect is that? <laughs> yeah. Cause I think, um, you know, I think, so it, again, people get these big ideas in their head and, and it's just so important to have the right gear and have the right mindset of what you're going to be doing and what you need exactly. And so, um, you know, 20 to 35 liters is perfect for an overnight trip. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, you can fit more in there and that it depends on how minimalist you go. But, um, uh, 35 to 50 liters is great for two nights. And then once you get higher than that, you're going to 50 to 80, 50 to 80 liters. And that's good for, you know, three to five days. And so the most important part of backpacking, backpack hunting is the pack and how well it fits you. Because a lot of people, I think, um, misunderstand and think they can just go choose any pack they want. And it, that's not true at all. You know, it's really important that you get the right frame size, the right waist belt size, because think about it when you load that pack down with 30, 40 pounds of gear, and then it's on you. If you don't have the right fitting pack, it's going to really, it could cause some damage. It could really hurt you. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, in this article, I talk about how you have to measure, uh, measure your spine for the right size frame that you need and, and how you're supposed to put the pack on. Cause you know, over 50% of the weight is supposed to actually sit on your hips compared to your shoulders. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. And so it's a super important that you have the right size pack and, and the right gear for the right gear for the back country. And, um, if you don't, you can really cause some injuries. Right. Well, thanks for that. I appreciate that. Those tips. And so how many days are you typically going when you're packing in? Um, well, it depends on what kind of hunt. If it's a bird hunt, uh, you know, two to three days. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's like the elk hunt that I'll be doing this fall, we'll go in for five days, five, six days. Okay. That's really what you need for a big game hunt. Um, but, you know, when you're, you're doing bird hunts, um, your dogs have to rest, you know, you can't, you can't push through kind of like we can, I mean, they could, and they would, you know, they want to, but you shouldn't mm -hmm. let them, um, 
you know, most of the time, most people hunt their dogs a day, let them rest a day, hunt a day, let them rest a day. And so that's kind of why I added a, another dog to the pack so that while one dog's resting, the other one can be hunting. So. All right. So let's talk about Jones. So he is your new English setter puppy. Yeah, he's from uh, Northwoods Bird Dogs up in Minnesota. And, and he's I, adorable. He is. He's a handful right now. He's, luckily, he's asleep right now. But that's what's funny is it's kind of, I'm used to other puppies who sleep, you know, for an hour, play for an hour, sleep for an hour. He does not. He has a lot of energy. So that's something new for me for sure. But um, that's a good sign though. That's, that is, that's a really is. good sign for the type of hunting dog you're going to have. He's very smart though. I mean, he's only, mm-hmm. well, he, he was nine weeks last Friday, but I've already taught him to sit and stay and I have him ring bells when he's got to go to the bathroom and um, so he's, he's going to be very smart. Uh, he's just a little bit of a handful right now. And, um, but he's the reason why I went with an English setter. Cause you know, I've, I grew up with labs my whole life and I wouldn't trade Lincoln for the world, but I wanted, um, a pointing breed to go along with my flushing breed. And so, uh, Lincoln, he's going to be seven in November. And so I knew, you know, he's getting older and he can't hunt forever. And, and I figured now would be the time to get another dog so that I can rest Lincoln a little bit more. I would eventually like to hunt them together, but that probably won't happen for a couple of years. So, right. Right. And so tell me about your thoughts on that, because you know, a lot of dog training stuff and you've been upland hunting for a long time and you've gone, you know, I'm sure with plenty of pointing dogs and flushing dogs, and there is, you know, this big kind of controversy of hunting a flushing breed and pointing breed together. Sure. And you know, that eventually that the, if your pointing dog is on point, your flushing dog is going to be running in and soon your pointing dog is going to stop pointing because they're learning, they're not getting that reward. Yeah. So tell me your, your approach on this and your so thoughts. I, I've hunted, my friends always had pointing breeds and flushers and they always hunted them together and we always hunted I always hunted with their dogs and Lincoln at the same time and I found that Lincoln started to understand when another dog was on point and we brought him over to flush that he understood what the pointing dog meant you know he he understood as soon as he saw that dog he knew there was a bird somewhere close and so I had never had an issue with it and the pointing breeds always continued to point and and that's because I was told so I talked to a bunch of Um, not only did I talk to my breeder about it, but, um, some of the trainers that I work with for gun dog. And cause I was telling them, I eventually want to run my dogs together. And they Mm -hmm. said, you can do that, but you don't want to do it for the first couple of years. And that's because you don't want your pointing breed to, like you said, um, think he's not being rewarded. You want to get them used to working as a team and make him understand, Hey, you're, you're still being rewarded for finding this bird. Lincoln's just coming into to flush it for you, you know, things like that. And so they said, it's going to take a lot of, um, off season training and, and to, you know, work the dogs together and that sort. And so they were telling me probably in about two years, they can work together on it. But, and again, Mm -hmm. I've hunted with flushers and pointers in the field, my entire upland career. And I've never seen an issue. You know, if you have a dog that's, that has bird drive and is well bred for that bird drive, you're not going to stop them from hunting birds, (laughs) you know, right. They're never going to get rid of that bird drive. Right. It's just, it just possibly a different look of their manners on birds. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, Telling me too, that they were saying, you right. don't want him to rush in. You want him to be steady to flush or shot. And so you don't want him rushing in at first because you're, he's scared Lincoln's taking his, his bird away. And I said, oh, okay, I understand. So that's, that's why they're saying it's going to take a couple of years. Cause you're going to want to train Jones for woe and, and, and things of that sort and make him understand that when Lincoln comes in, it's okay. Right. So right. That and that, and I think that could just come easy too, with just, um, you know, the honoring, the backing, mm-hmm. that part, that aspect of it too. It, I was on a hunt where um, the pointing breeds were wearing beeper collars mm-hmm. and it <laughs> didn't take too long for the the flushing dogs to understand when they're hearing that beeping sound, there's a bird and they're just rumbling over from the next field. (laughs) So, and you had, you know, kind of an intro with English setters because that's what your grandpa had field trialing. Is that what you said? Yeah. So he, he, I grew up with, um, 
my grandpa had a ton of English setters at, at his farm that he raised um, and trained for field trialing. And so I was around them all the time and he always had a couple in the house, of course. And so it was kind of when it came to the point of what's the next breed you want, what kind of pointing breed do you want? It was kind of like an homage to my grandpa that, okay, I'm going to get an English setter. You know, that's, you know, that's, I thought that was really neat and my mm -hmm. family was all about it. And I, I knew their temperament and I knew the breed pretty well. And so it was kind of, there was no question that I was that uh, that's what I was going to get, and so I was fortunate enough to talk to a few people and get recommendations of where to get a setter from, and that's what led me to Northwoods Bird Dogs. And I went up there and I visited their facilities and I talked with Jerry and Betsy, and I was just really impressed. And so I actually had a deposit down last around last March, and that and then um, the puppies whelped. They whelped a little bit late this year, but that's okay. And that's how I got Jones. So awesome! And you made the drive over there to get them. Oh yeah, I drove. So, uh, you know, when I was in Illinois, I put the deposit down. That was only a, a 10 hour drive or something. <laughs> right. you know, I wasn't really back then planning on moving to Utah. And so, <laughs> but I didn't want to not choose them in person. You know, this is a dog I'm going to have for a really long time. And I just wanted to go and, and see which one I liked in person and bonded with in person. And that's where Jones came along. So he caught my eye as soon as I got there. He was a yeah. feisty little one he was wrestling and he was always off kind of exploring by himself and I thought that was really neat and then the last final final thing that I knew he was mine was I let Lincoln out of the car to play fetch for a little bit and he just keyed in on Lincoln he sat there and watched him like who is this cool. and what is this and I just thought that was really neat so yeah I love it when they when they kind of choose you yeah I thought that was really cool yeah so he's how old now uh, he turned nine weeks on last Friday. So, okay. So mm -hmm. what's your, what's your plan for him this season? So, um, we're working on basic obedience right now. We're going to do sit, stay, heal, come, and then we're just going to get him on a bunch. I'm going to get him on a bunch of wild birds this, this yeah. fall. He's going to go hunting. He's going to go camping. He went on his first camping trip last weekend and he did really well. Great. And exposure to wild birds. That's just what, um, Jerry recommended he said that's the best thing to do in their first season and don't worry if he bumps birds you know just um, get him out there and get him used to it and he's gonna find you birds yeah he may bump them but he's gonna find them for you and then so we'll work we'll hunt this year and then um, next and then coming you know when the season is done that's when we'll start fine-tuning things like whoa and uh, you know just this little things like that but um, he's bred so well that I know he's going to do well and it's just super important to get him to exposed to everything early on. Are you going to be taking him um, packing in with you then? Well, yeah, maybe, you know, there's some things, um, some hunts here I want to do like chase ptarmigan um, and for those here definitely have to backpack in. And so I don't see why that would be a problem. Um, I want to get him used to camping and backpacking as much as possible uh, he'll probably be too little, little to carry his own pack, but you know, linking mm -hmm. carry his stuff for him. But yeah, I would like to do things like that. And I would yeah. like to get him exposed to all sorts of wild birds, whether that be chucker here or going to Nebraska for sharpies and, and pheasants or Idaho for huns and quail, you know, things I'm going to get him, try to just get him exposed to as much as possible. And he's sleeping through this whole conversation, not, not able to hear all the exciting things he had in <laughs> store for him. <laughs> he's got big things planned for the fall, that's for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. What a lucky dog. Wow. It'll be good. I think it'll be fine. I think it'll be, um, I have to, and then there's going to be a lot of training for me as well. You know, I'm, I'm only used to one dog right now, so I got to get mm -hmm. used to two. And that has been a transition trying to go hiking and get everything ready, trying to get two dogs ready to do all that. But it's oh, I bet. I've really enjoyed it. So, yeah. And do you have a big enough vest to be able to put Jones in there for a little break on his puppy legs That's while you're packing a good in? Question. Yeah, I um, <laughs> new vest this year and that you're right. I do need to make sure he can fit in one of them. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what, what, um, What's your favorite bird species to hunt? I, that's really hard for me to say because I just love all of them. They all have a different uh, quality about them that, you know, is super awesome. You know, if you're hunting chucker, you're up in the mountains in this really rugged, hot, dry terrain, and it's right. really hard hunting. Uh, you know, if you're hunting um, pheasants, you're in this beautiful rolling terrain or, you know, some 
you know, Milo or things of that sort. And, you know, or you're up in Idaho and uh, you're up in Southern Idaho and you can get into all kinds of species, you know, chucker, uh, quail and huns, and they all bring their own something to the field. And that's just what I really enjoy about it. And um, I do it all. And um, sometimes I go out and I don't see anything. And sometimes I go out and I get into a bunch of birds, you know, had a one heck of a trip to Idaho last fall, plan on going back there because it's super easy for me to drive there now. And, you know, we got into three different species of birds and that's just so fun. And I just love, you know, I got my, my buddy in Iowa, Mike calling me saying, where are we hunting this year? You know, what are we doing? And we're, you know, we want to do something we never done. And we're talking about going to the sand hills in Nebraska to chase Sharpies and, and, you know, and I've got other guys saying, Hey, are we going back to Idaho? And, you know, I'm just like, it's just, that's just like so fun just to be able to, chase all these different species and all this different terrain and just get after it and enjoy it with people that you, you know, can call your best friends. And that's just kind of what I love about it all. Absolutely. Is, do you, have you found that chucker hunting is the most challenging out of the hunting that you do? Yes. Um, yeah. it's, it's steep, it's hot, it's, um, a little bit dangerous and, and they run all the way up the hill just to fly back over your head. And so <laughs> um, it's, it's challenging and that's what I like about it. And um, they're just a fun bird to hunt. They really are. They call them the red legged devils. And that's for a reason because they are a hard species <laughs> to hunt. So, and luck, I'm fortunate enough here in Utah, there's a bunch of chucker hunters who um, I've made friends with, and I hope to get out with them a little bit this year to really show me the ropes of chucker hunting cool. but um it's funny when I prep for chucker hunting I kind of I prepare in a different way I take my trap um thrower out and I do all kinds of weird shooting positions because that's how it is when you're hunting chucker you're up on this steep hill they they run all the way up I say hill I mean mountain you're on this steep mountain and they run up and then they flush back over your head and so you have to do a really be prepared for really weird shooting positions and so I like to, straight up in the air Straight, straight up or you're, or you're, you're perched on the side of a cliff and now you have to swing your whole body, you know, back down the mountain trying to get a shot off. And so you got to practice that stuff because if not, it's, you know, you come in sure. unprepared. And so, um, it's just fun. It makes it fun. It makes it worth it. And the views while you're out there are beautiful. And, you know, it's just all about the experience. How did the dogs do on the terrain? So, um, Lincoln, he, um, he does well. He's, of course, he's a flusher and that's, you know, part of the reason too, why I wanted a pointer because in chucker country, it would help a little bit more to have a pointing breed, but he does well. And now it does cut up his paws. Um, you know, it's, it's that rocky, um, gritty, you know, mountain terrain. And so it does end up cutting up his paws after a couple of days, but he does well and he loves it. You know, he loves anything being out there with me at any time, but um, I found Chuck, uh, Lincoln does just fine, but after, you know, a day and a half, he needs to rest. Sure. So, um, I do too, after a day and a half of Chucker. So. <laughs> I, <bet. laughs> I, get it. I get it. Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what bird species haven't you hunted yet that you'd like to? You know, I haven't hunted quail a whole lot. I'd like okay. to go to Arizona, um, mm -hmm. and hunt gambles down there. And, um, I would like to hunt snowcock. <laughs> That's yeah. a whole different hunt into itself. Right. Um, I haven't hunted in like Georgia for quail. I would like to do that. Um, really, I'd like to just try it all. I haven't hunted in the east for grouse. I would love to go to Maine or or um, wherever there to the east coast to hunt um, mm -hmm. in the thick timber in there. You know, there's a whole bunch of things I'd love to do. Yeah. Have okay. you been grouse hunting up in um, like Northern Wisconsin or Michigan yet? So I, I went with Lincoln and I did um, a hunt together in Wisconsin and that was really neat. And um, it was my first time and I did it with, and I knew going in, I needed to be careful because you know, everybody told me you can get turned around real easily in the grouse woods. Oh, up yeah. and man, were they right. It's scary. <laughs> so, yeah. It is kind of scary. It, oh, I've been lost several times. <laughs> It's kind of scary. Me and I were hunting and we were doing great. And um, now I went early season, so the leaves hadn't dropped yet. So uh, we, we had been hunting all morning and we were turning around to go take a break for the afternoon. And we had just gotten to this really, really thick stuff. And, you know, I had, mm -hmm. I had um, marked camp on my onyx and on my, 
uh, in reach and, and I was tracking everything just because I knew how hard, how easy it was to get turned around there. And what do you know, we get turned around and we're in this really thick stuff where it was, you're crawling on all fours, trying to get through. And I, I had to take a break a minute and kind of breathe. Cause I knew the trail was in front of me somewhere to get back to camp. I go, I know it's right here, but I don't remember going through all this stuff when we were coming. And I had to take a minute and like control myself and say, you're fine. You're not lost. You know where you are. You know, the trail is right through here. You just got to get through it. And I had to kind of compose myself because, you know, you're in the woods a far mm-hmm. away from anybody. You don't have cell service. <laughs> and so, um, and those devil birds are luring you in oh, one step yeah. closer. Come and on like, in. Everything looks <laughs> everything looks the same and so yeah it was fine you know what a hundred yards later I pushed through and there was the trail but um um, we did get into birds up there actually we flushed um we flushed some grouse and I just I'm so amazed by grouse hunters who can shoot through those trees and hit anything (laughs) I kind of said a Hail Mary you know and um (laughs) it was fun and I'd love to go back and do it sometime but um Lincoln did well and he got back on the birds, but you know, they don't, when they flush, they don't go too far. We were, we were able to right. get back on them, but the problem was I'm pushing through brush while the birds are, you know, only 10 yards in front of me. Why couldn't I even see him flush? I could hear him, mm-hmm. but I couldn't see him. So it was, yeah. it was something you can I'd hear like the thunder back. roll. I'd like to go back again when the, and go later in the season when the leaves had dropped. I would like yeah. To. You were probably there. Um, like when there's good woodcock going through, did well, you get and that's, into some that's, of those? That's what I was, that's honestly what I, I was going up to try to get into woodcock and grouse. And mm-hmm. I must've been like one week late because I didn't run into, I did not find one woodcock. Hmm. And I thought that was really strange. And, um, but I think I had just missed the migration. So, okay. But yeah, yeah. I went up there with the intentions of getting into woodcock and grouse. Yeah. Go when the leaves are falling. And I think a fresh snow is, is my favorite to hunt in. Yeah. I'd love to do that up there. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell us a little bit about the gun dog magazine now. So, so tell me if somebody hasn't ever heard of, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, impossible, but let's say if they haven't heard of the magazine, never picked it up. Um, what can we expect out of it? Sure. So gun dog, you know, has been around a long time and it is just the magazine devoted to upland hunting and dog training, DIY dog training. And it is the go-to magazine for all of that. And when I took over last year, when Rick retired, um, it's an iconic magazine and I didn't want to change what the magazine talks about and tells their readers. I didn't want to do that at all because it is the premier dog training magazine. And so, but I, what I wanted to do was um, make sure that we included, because I do think that there's a new wave of upland hunters. I think it's reaching younger audiences. And I don't know if that has to do just because it has to do with dogs or what, but um, you know, when I first came in, if you did hashtag upland hunting or hashtag bird dog on Instagram, it had over like a million hits. And so I knew that the younger generation needed to be reached. And to do that, um, I wanted to make sure that gun dog not only talked about dog training, but it was the magazine your go-to for upland hunting as well. You know, how to do it, where to do it, the gear you need and things of that sort. And so last year we really focused on new content, new writers, new design, um, you know, kind of bringing it more into the 21st century. And, and we've really seen an upcharge um, in readership because of that. And, So not only do we have our columns devoted to here's how to train your dog, um, but our features and other things now focus on gear, uh, the gear you need for both you and your dog, but it also is talking about here's where to go upland hunting, here's how to do it, Hmm. uh, here's where we recommend, and you know we're getting uh, my you know my freelance writers are all avid upland hunters who travel every weekend to go chase birds or, you know, plan these big, you know, trips every fall to go hunt birds in a state they've never been or going back to places. And so um, I wanted to make sure that Gundog really was the, your guide to the uplands and, and, and stuck with the younger generation and the magazine that they want to subscribe to, to figure out where to go and, you know, where to chase birds at. Well, how great that people are willing to share their sweet spots of hunting. 
Oh yeah. And, <laughs> and it's, it's just, they're giving advice on, um, you know, I had Ben Bretton and he wrote a great, a great article, um, in the September issue of, Hey, if you work, not everyone can just go take two weeks off work. You know, if you're a nine to five guy who only has his weekends, here's how to utilize them. Here's where to go. You know, mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool. And then I've got Tony Peterson, he really um, narrowed down the top six spots in the country to, to go and find birds, what bird species to hunt. We talked to biologists to say, this is the area you need to go in. And, and you know, we're just trying to give nice. people the, the advice of kind of do the hard work for them, you know, right. like, hey, we've narrowed it down for you. Here's where you need to go. Right. And even, I mean, the, the types of terrain, it's, you can, you can be told, I'm going to go to Eastern Mon Montana to hunt some pheasant or mm -hmm. get into sharp tail. But unless you understand their cover and the terrain there, it's not easy. So no, it's not. And that's I, all a huge learning curve. It is. I had, um, I had someone else write an article earlier about hunting Sharpies in the sand hills. And it's like, Hey, here, here's where we recommend you go, but here's how we recommend you get prepared because you know, right. it's a ton of hiking. It's a ton of this. And, and, you know, just try to give people that advice that they may not think of. And we just, again, I want to be your go-to guide to upland hunting and um, the go-to magazine for just everything upland inspired, you know, here's how to train your dog and here's where to go hunt him when he is trained. So, right. So Kelly, in the times where so much has gone digital, how are you guys working this that they're still picking up that magazine, you know, picking it out of the grocery store mm -hmm. magazine rack. How are yeah, you so, working well, on that side? Um, you know, we did a, I hear a lot of people say print is dead. And I'm like, I'm not sure where you're getting that stack from. I'm not yeah. sure if you made that mm -hmm. or what, but that's not true. Um, especially in the magazine world, it could be for newspapers just because people can get instant news online. But for magazines, we actually found, we did a survey and the younger generation are all saying that they still read magazines, which I thought was mm -hmm. really cool. And yep. um, during this COVID, especially we, our numbers were continuing to grow, but during COVID, we actually saw a rise in our subscription. Um, you know, people are at home and they're reading. They want that that nice magazine in their hand. They want to flip through those pages and you know see the beautiful photography. And so, we really focused on. We knew because of that, Gun Dog needed a, a fresher look. It needed to be beautiful and inviting. And so we we redesigned the whole magazine and really focused on uh, photography, not only just content, but great photography, great design, so that it's, you know, people want to look at it because it's a beautiful magazine. And so um, we focused on that, but then we also focused on um, spreading our message via the web and, and social media, because let's be honest, you know, everyone's on their phone every two seconds scrolling Instagram. And right. so to get your brand name out there, you really need to have a presence on, on Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter and, and on all those platforms. And so we really put a sharp focus on um, making sure we're putting good content on there that makes people want to follow us and in turn, hopefully pick up the magazine. And then on the web sharing, um, you know, articles that people are looking for a quick Google search and gun dog is at the top of the list. Cause we're bringing, you know, answers to the people's questions and, and this mm -hmm. informative articles online. And so we really, not only did we focus on updating the print, but we really focused on the whole package, you know, whatever. Do you have so exclusive content in the magazine that people can't find online? We do. We, okay. um, um, so right away we have articles that you know we can't obviously can't put them all online or there's no point in buying the print magazine and exactly. so mm -hmm. um we do we have very exclusive articles that only go in the print uh whether that be our columns on dog training or some of the features and and things of that sort but we do share some of it on online after the magazine has um um you know gone off of press and things but not all of it so yeah it is it is very exclusive to the magazine where you can only get that content on in the print version or we now offer print when you get a subscription not only do you get the the printed version but you have access to like the ipad digital version you know things of that sort so mm -hmm. yeah it's very it's exclusive and it's it's part of why you want to get um a subscription to gun dog you know have that right there in your house some information that not everyone has what are some of the plans for the future that you're looking to make changes with yet? Sure. So we've got, um, 
we've been talking about a lot of plans, nothing set in stone yet, but we do think the way the magazine world is kind of doing that nice, perfect bound, big, heavy stock magazine that's big and beautiful. And so um, we've been talking about Gundog uh, upping it to 120 page magazine with a beautiful hard stock cover and things of that sort, something more of a coffee table-esque magazine that you're proud sure. to have laying around the house. And so we've been talking about that. We've been talking about doing um, um, some, some subscription. You can only get in and see these training videos if you have a subscription and things of that sort. And so big changes coming here next year. It's all still being finalized, but um, we're, we're really happy with the direction that Gundog is going. And so um, we really want to take it to the next level. Very cool. So like you have a team of people that you work with then? Yeah, so it's me, and then we have a, a new associate editor named Nathan Ratchford, and he's a young go-getter. He's a big, um, really into bird dog breeds and upland hunting, um, so he just came on board, so he's going to help produce the magazine. And then we have our art director, Chuck Beasley, who um, is the mastermind behind the artwork that goes into Gundog, and then, of course, we have our production staff and um, our publisher, Layden Force. So, that's and, about it. and so the majority of these people are all gun dog hunters themselves. Yeah, so gun dog um, owners, I was just saying, yeah, <laughs> gun dog so, owners and hunters. Um, definitely hunters for sure. Not all of them are upland hunters, but um, okay. they enjoy it and they enjoy hunting and they enjoy this industry and um, they're just avid about uh, everything they do and they're they're really dedicated to gun dog and so I really appreciate all of them. So how have you found yourself fitting in to this role in the last, well, would you say a year and a half, almost two years? I mean, are you the first woman editor of the magazine? <laughs> yeah, I think I am actually. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, that's huge. When I um, took over, it wasn't really a surprise to anyone in the industry just because they knew how big of an upland nut I am. Um, but I, um, you know, I've, I've settled in well. It took me a little bit because I came from the big game world. So it took me a little bit to um, get to know all the, the trainers, dog trainers and the dog hunting world. Um, but I still have my hands in the big game world too, because I'm passionate about that. So they were nice enough to also let me take over Backcountry Hunter magazine. And um, so I, I feel very fulfilled that I get to do two things that I really love, two magazines, the two types of hunting that I love to do. And um, honestly, everyone in the industry is, you know, just loved it and been super great to me and super helpful. And I couldn't appreciate them more. What, um, have you found yourself with any kind of big challenges in this position? Um, I really don't think so. I think, um, since I was able to kind of establish myself in the industry for the past, you know, four years that, um, you know, it, it, everything was fine. I will say when I first started out in the industry, I definitely had to um, make sure everyone knew that I was a hunter and kind of prove myself that way. And which is fine. I think everyone starts out that way, whether you're, mm -hmm. you know, a young guy or a young female and um, definitely had to prove my worth. And I made sure that I like to stay humble and not pretend that I know things that I don't know. <laughs> you know, I think asking questions is a lot better than pretending. And so I was able to, you know, kind of come into this industry young and um, ready to learn. And that really helped me get to where I am today because I had a lot of people willing to help me. And I think hunters are kind of some of the nicest people you can ever meet. You know, they're, they want to share with you their knowledge. And I think that's just great. Yeah. And that's, I think that's just important for the whole industry in general to be able to keep the hunting heritage going and um, being available as a mentor and, and be welcoming. Yeah, I think it's, it's funny. It's just, I had so many people wanting to help me and it's really helped me get to where I am today and made me the hunter that I am. And I'm so appreciative of it. Mm -hmm. And being a DIY hunter, you're probably a big advocate for public land. Oh, yeah. I'm young and, um, you know, can't really afford to buy my own private land. And so I have to, um, hunt public land and I love that. And I think, um, it's such a great resource for new and young hunters uh, coming into this sport. They have millions of acres of, of hunting grounds they can hunt. And yeah, you're not guaranteed an animal since you're hunting public land, but 
I just think I'm a huge advocate of that because that's all I can do. And not only just hunting, but, you know, camping, hiking, everything. And so I'm a huge advocate of public lands um, um, and, and supporting that, you know, whole wave of hunters. And um, I hope that it always stays that way because I just think that's so great that our country offers millions of acres of free resources to any individual. It's, it's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. And like you said earlier, it's just so much about the experience of being out there and, and having a likely goal of just starting small and enjoying being out there instead of just having a harvest that day. Well, I just think, you know, hunting and being outside and, and doing all of this just brings so much more to the table. Just It's a therapeutic thing for me, you know, to, you know, having a stressful week and you just, you know, you know what, I'm going to go camping this weekend. I'm going to go hiking mm-hmm. and you just go out there with your dogs and, and it is, you know, kind of brings you just so much peace, at least it does to me. And so that's, you know, part of the reason why I really enjoy it. Absolutely. So you have like the best go-to source for all things gear. So if you don't mind, I really want to pick your brain on, on some of the stuff that you use personally, because you're having all the best resources from, for sure, from your position. I do. I do. <laughs> I'm very fortunate in that, that I get to try out a lot of different things. And so, but I like to share those things with people. I like to tell them what I think works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And, um, I will say it has been super hard to be a female upland hunter and find mm-hmm. gear that really fits. I'm fortunate because I'm five nine and you know I can kind of wear men's clothes, but a lot of women are five five and shorter. And so um mm-hmm. um I have always for the last, you know, since forever, I've always ran my vest has always been the Filson, the real simple strap vest. And I did that because when you're, you know, hunting miles and miles and going to tr- in chucker country, you need something lightweight. So mm-hmm. I've always ran that vest. Um it's, I like it. I don't like that there's not a hydration system um, set up for, I have to kind of rig something up for mine um, because I have to, I carry a camelback water bladder for the dogs yep. And, yep. and for myself too. And so, um, but I'm really excited this year because I got a couple new vests in and there's this one that um, called Hunt Ready and they're a new organization. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying, I'm going to try their vest this year. I put it on the other day and it was probably one of the best fitting packs I've ever put on. And I think it's Mm -hmm. because they focus on backpacking. Like they kind of, they're not only they, I think they're from the military and they understand what, you know, military standards of a well-fitting pack, but they also understand backpacking packs. And so they kind of made their vest fit like a backpacking pack where it fits really nice around your hips and on your shoulders and things of that sort. And a lot of adjustments okay. you can make. And, and they're very into, um, he, he has a daughter and she is young and she's really getting into upland hunting and, and dog training. And so he's really into making sure that this stuff fits women. And I thought that okay. was really neat. And, yeah. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to run this hunt ready pack this year and try it okay. out. I think, I think that'd be really good for women because it fit me really well. And okay. so, um, but then another pack Proist, they do a really good job with women's gear. They um, do. Yeah. Kirsty over there, she's done a great job and they just came out with a new pack and it fits yep. really well. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I think that's good for all women to look into. And then their up pros upland pants, um, they fit well and they're really durable. And what they're I like, the best. Yeah. <laughs> what I like about them is that they're not stiff. They're made of, you know, of a fabric that stretches because, um, you know, when you're hunting long days or up mountains or sorts, you don't really want a thick stocky cart heart or something. You want something that's really, um, more athletic and, yeah. um, pros did a really good job with their pants. Yeah. And you can just wear, you know, like a spandex pants or something underneath of those, sure. the pros, those pros brush pants if need be, if it starts getting cooler out. Yep. yep. Um, and I do, I have the, I have the pros vest. Um, I got it a couple months ago and it's great. I've, I've just obviously only worn it hiking and when I'm out training dogs, the only thing I notice is I am getting my gun caught up in the shoulder strap cause it's got some padding to it. Okay. Okay. And that's the only thing for me, but my husband just got, actually I got him for his birthday, the new final rise vest. Have you heard of that one? 
episode, Final Rise, I work um, I yeah. with Matt. He's going to send yeah. me one here soon um, to try out. Awesome. I was really impressed with Matt and, you know, he and his wife are at home making those vests. And, um, he's here in Utah, so I hope to hunt with him a little bit this Perfect. fall. Perfect. Really great guy. And um, yeah. He is a huge tucker hunter, so he he understands what one needs in a vest. And the only reason I hadn't mentioned that one yet because I haven't gotten my hands on it, but I'm excited yeah. to try that one as well. Yeah, check yeah. it out. Our yeah. heart, his, my husband's just arrived, I think, like about a week ago, um, and it is a process. I mean, it's like a six to eight week wait to get one because, like you said, they're they're out there just making them by hand. Him, his yeah. wife, put into it all day. And, but it's amazing. And, and my husband was pretty loyal to wing works for years. I think he's yep. had like his pack is, or his vest is about 15 years old, but he put this one on and it's pretty slick and I've worn it and I love it. <laughs> I told Matt, I'm gonna, I was like, well, I think I'm going to need one of those too, <laughs> but I'm excited to see what you think about it. Well, I'm excited to get hands on it too. I know he's super busy, um, but there's a ton of, um, um, new new upland companies this year i kind of did a vest review yeah. in the september issue and there's um not only final rise hunt ready but pike gear they've got a good vest out there mm -hmm. um, you know ring works is a good one and then um you know if you're going real minimalist you know going with filson but i like to tell people that they really need to look for a system that can hold a water bladder or at least a couple of water bottles because you need water for your dogs or you're not going to get very far so yeah um, yeah. And in that pros vest, um, you can actually, have you put yours on yet? Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And you can fit two water bottles on each side mm -hmm. and, and the water bladder in the back. So it's pretty, yeah, they've come a long way. They, water. They, they, they kind of started out in the female category and, um, kind of went low key for a couple of years and now they're back big time. Mm -hmm. So I think they're doing yeah. a really good job and really offering, um, women some really good gear because it is hard to find it's hard to find gear out there it really is so yeah so what are you all keeping in your vest Callie when you're out bird hunting sure so I keep um a small first aid kit for well Lincoln and Jones now I try to put in there um some medical scissors uh I carry I always carry a leatherman in my pocket in case I need to pull out quills or thorns or anything of that sort. Um, I keep gauze, I keep Benadryl, um, you know, that, that's just a tiny little med kit that I keep in my pack until I can at least get back to the truck if anything big happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I carry a water bladder. Um, I carry, um, a lot of times if I'm off the grid, I'll carry a Garmin inReach, which is a satellite device to, that I use for texting in case of an emergency. Mm -hmm. um and of course i carry a camera <laughs> and my shells and um i guess that's about it what kind of camera are you carrying so i'm i actually went to school for photography i'm technically a photojournalist and so i'm kind of a camera snob but um, oh awesome i used to carry a big heavy uh nikon d700 and when i started doing this backpacking and really off the grid hunting stuff it was just too heavy you know it's way too it probably added 10 12 pounds to my pack and so i um recommended for my friend tess who's a professional photographer she told me we're both nikon girls and uh she got the new uh nikon z and I said, you know, it's a mirrorless camera. And that's, you know, before mirrorless used to be just, you know, crappy little cameras. And I said, mirrorless, you're going mirrorless. She's like, no, I'm telling you, like, they're now more powerful than your full frame cameras. And I was like, what? And so I ended up buying it and it has been the best purchase of a camera I've ever made. Um, um, it's, it's, it's small, it's lightweight, and it's easy to throw in my pack. And it takes better images than my D700. And so oh, I just, wow. I'll never look back after that. Okay. I have the Z6, I think. What is it? The Z6? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's um, it's a mirrorless and it's, um, um, it's small, it's lightweight. And it comes, what the, half the reason I bought it was because you can buy a adapter to use your big regular lens with lenses mm -hmm. with it. And so that was really appealing to me because I was like, man, I have all these really nice lenses. I don't want to get rid of them. And so I have an adapter to use my lenses, but 
this, if you buy it as a package, the stock lens that comes with it is like a thousand dollar lens and you get it for like 200 bucks with the package. And I honestly have only mostly used that lens because it's such a nice lens. Nice. Okay. Yeah, it's That's called the good to know. Six. It's mirrorless, but it's, um, it's just, it takes amazing photos, all manual, uh, also takes video. So I'm, I've, it's honestly been one of the best camera purchases I've ever made. Cool. Well, I need one. Last one I had was a high school graduation gift. So I need to get a new camera. That sounds perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, are you using some of your photos in Gundog magazine then? Oh yeah. I take, um, I do, uh, on all my trips to take all, all my own photos. And I, that's part of, you know, I enjoy that. I'm, I'm a photographer. And so I always, I try to enjoy the hunt, but I also know every time I'm on a trip that it's probably going to get written up for the magazine. And so I need to make sure I document it well. Yeah. So. Perfect. Um, what kind of shotgun are you using? So I carry a Browning Satori Feather in 20 gauge. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had that one for a while and it's going to be hard for me to use anything else because I just love it so much. And um, <laughs> I like 20 gauge because it's just lighter weight. Okay. Have you done much shooting with a 12 gauge? Oh yeah. And there's nothing wrong with a 12, but when you're, um, you know, hiking in chuckers or, you know, going all day, uh, mm -hmm. bird hunting, you to carry that extra pound or two, it really, you really start to feel it. It's, it's really yeah. surprising if you ever get out and one day carry a lightweight, you know, six pound gun. And then the next day carry a seven, eight pound gun. Like you really notice it. It's so, a big difference. Even when I've tried out a couple, just shooting on the range, I can notice a difference. You can notice that when you start carrying it, yeah. you know, you're a wild bird hunter, you know, you don't see birds every two seconds. And so right. when you're hunting a couple miles at a time and you got this big, uh, seven and a half pound, eight pound gun in your hand, it, it's, it starts to take a toll on you. So, but there's nothing Absolutely. wrong with 12 gauge. There's nothing wrong with it. I just prefer 20 just because it's lighter. Do you waterfall hunt as well? I only waterfowl hunt when I get invited. Um, okay. only because I don't have the knowledge to do it, you know, mm -hmm. and, but I have, I'm fortunate enough. I have a lot of friends who are duck hunters. And so I like it. I enjoy it. I just don't have the gear or the equipment or the knowledge for it. But, um, part of my moving here, I, you can hunt the great salt lake and my friend Steve, um, for, with camp chef, he's a big waterfowler and, um, he takes me out him and his buddy on their airboat sometimes. And we go hunt ducks and it's just a blast. And so, I knew moving here, I was hoping Steve would take me out a few times, you know, <laughs> so it's cool. It's good. What about boots? What are you, what are you wearing? Is it different on the Trucker Hills than what you? So I've always been um, adamant about, I prefer a trekking boot over like a hunting boot. Just okay. Just because lighter weight and um, um, more, um, just sturdy to me. So I like Loa. I wear a lot of Loa. Um, hmm. I per, I'm trying to find the brand that I like. Um, I've always worn Loa. I'm a huge fan of them. I, um, I think they're sturdy and they've la they last me for years. And so, um, I wear the women's GTX and, um, you know, I can go two or three years before I have to um, you know, buy a new pair of hunting boots. So, um, okay. there's nothing yeah, that, wrong with hunting boots. I just, so just, just from backpacking and such, I was just, um, so used to, uh, you know, always trying to find a, a trekking boot that, um, they're so lightweight and durable that that's what I really prefer. I like the, the Maria GTX from Loa. And I also like the lady lights from Loa. Okay. And that's a new brand name for me. I haven't heard that one. So yeah, Loa, they're big in the mountaineering and backpacking world and, but they okay. do make hunting boots as well. They make really great hunting boots, but, um, just to cut down on weight, I went with more of a trekking boot. And so, mm -hmm. um, anything from them, I highly recommend. What is, do you have any other kind of go-to apparel that you like to take on every hunt with you? Uh -huh. I like to wear, um, Merino wool base layers when it's cold out. Okay. Um, merino wool really wicks away moisture really well and it dries really well and it keeps you super warm. Are you using are you, um, Proas for that? Um, I use uh, Kuyu and okay. uh, First Light and um, they, 
you can wear them. I'm always, I always, you know, I, it's funny. I kind of wear the same thing while hunting. I don't know if it's just kind of a um, thing in my head or what, but I always wear the kind of the same base layer shirt. And um, I don't always wear um, thermal pants just because I get so hot while hi hiking. Um, but I do when it's really cold out. But I like merino wool again because it um, wicks away moisture. And if you're going backpacking for a few days and you can't take a shower, it cuts down on the stench. <laughs> so <laughs> you know what? When I interviewed Kirsty at Pro, she said that too. I'm like, no way. <laughs> it does. It does. You really don't smell, them, so that's really nice. Yeah. And um, uh, and then I like. Uh, I have a pair of my upland pants are a pair of these old Cabela's. Um, instinct line, which I'm really sad they don't make them anymore. So I'm hoping they last me for a while, but if not, I'll just go to Proas. And, um, or sometimes I'll just wear a pair of my Kuyu um, hunting pants, which aren't up upland pants at all. But if I'm not hunting through briars and brush and stuff, then I can, I can wear those and they work just fine. Okay. Um, what about game bird recipes? Do you have a favorite? So I do, I, I, um, anything I hunt, I eat. And so I, um, I like to try new things and make up new things. And I always tell my friends are always asking about this one. I call it pheasant pesto pasta. And I just made it up one night. Um, I just take pheasant breasts and I kind of, you know, smash them so they're thinner and I, um, put a little bit of salt and pepper on them and just grill them. And then I make like a pesto pasta and I put, uh, the pheasant mm. breasts in there and it's just super simple and super easy, but, um, it's delicious and I love it. And then of course I make, you know, tacos and, um, trying to think what else. Sometimes I'll fry them and, and, you know, I just, I, I only, I basically only eat wild game now. <laughs> I hardly buy Yeah, Cause you have enough that you can have that year round. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's, I just really enjoy it. And, um, I will buy fish every now and then, but when it comes to meat, I'm mostly only eating birds or, or big game. So yeah. What is your favorite big game? Um, elk for sure. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's not gamey and it's just delicious and, um, can make a steak or ground, ground meat. And it's, um, just one of my favorites. And I got a whole freezer full from the one and only elk that I've ever shot, but you know, that's 200 plus pounds of meat. So it's going to last right. me a while. <laughs> and I haven't had elk yet. So like, what would you recommend be a first time, I guess, like uh, recipe for well, somebody to be trying elk for the first time. Well, elk is just such a good meat. Like you don't, you wouldn't even know you're eating elk unless someone told you, you know, it tastes, okay. it doesn't taste any different. It's delicious. And so even just having an elk steak um, would be perfect or just having okay. ground, maybe, or if, if you're a little worried about that, just maybe making chili with some ground elk or a hamburger, like you would never even know it. it I don't want to say it tastes like beef, but it's, it's essentially that you would, you would never be able to tell that you're eating elk. I'm going to have to try that with my mom. She, every, when she comes to visit, she's always worried about what we're going to eat. If it's going to be <laughs> something not, not packaged in the store. So <laughs> need to yeah. always hide it for her a little bit. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> um, if, for gun dog magazine, what, where can people get subscription for that? So they can get it online at gundogmag.com okay. or, um, well, yeah, online. Um, you can also get it, you know, if you pick up a magazine at the store, there'll be a little insert card in there that you can sign up on. But the easiest way is to go to gundogmag.com. And in the right-hand corner at the top, you'll see subscribe now. And um, it's really cool. Our subscriptions now are we're including the print and the digital version. So you're kind of getting a two for one there. And oh, nice. uh, for right now um, we're running a special of um, it's only 1099 for a year's worth of gun dog. And so, Holy cow. Uh, yeah. So that's seven issues. And how often is that coming out? Yeah. Seven issues. Okay. And um, um, again, next year, probably going to, you know, up that to a big, beautiful magazine and give you access to all these training videos and such. And so it's a really cool opportunity to, to subscri subscribe to Gundog. Okay. I will put that in my show notes. Um, yeah. So if you, um, if you subscribe now, uh, 
you'll get the back issues. They'll eventually come. I'm not sure the time frame, but they do show up in print. And but it will give you instant digital access to the digital versions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. It's like right now, like September just hit newsstands. So if you signed up today, you'd get September. It wouldn't be, you know, it'd, it'd take a, a week or two, but um, and then from there on out, you get the the rest of the year on time. But you know. Okay. And you guys recently did a issue on the Bracco Italiano. So that was yeah, one of my totally. favorite issues. Yeah, yeah I, I think. Um, really cool dog. They are. Have you hunted over any yet? No, I haven't. I haven't. And I, I have a buddy, Mike, he just, he loves them because they look like hound dogs, you know. But um, <laughs> every time I post anything online about Broncos, people just love it. They're really engaged with it. So I think that's really neat. Well, they are pretty amazing. They drool a lot, but yeah, I'm but sure they're pretty do. great. <laughs> oh, fun. Well, hopefully I can meet up with you sometime this year and you can hunt over some Broncos for the first time. Yeah, you let me know. We'll meet up anywhere. <laughs> I like to drive. They call my friends call me the road warrior. So, well, I'm just in Western Montana over by Missoula, so it's not too far of a drive, oh, but perfect. I'm We're happy to, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'm happy to meet you in Idaho too, because um, we, I just moved here in September, so just got out in our backyard a little bit last year for dusky grouse. Um, but yeah, so hoping to explore some more this year and enjoy the, enjoy the great. West. For yeah. Sure. Um, how can we find you on social media, Kelly? Um, sure. So really Instagram's the way to go. And then my handle is just my name, which is Callie Parmley, K-A-L-I-P-A-R-M-L-E-Y. And that's my Instagram handle. And I'm most active on that. And that's where I share all my, um, you know, hunting photos and things of that sort. So amazing or, pictures. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And then, um, if you want to follow gun dog, um, uh, just gun dog mag, um, on Instagram and then gun dog magazine on Facebook. Perfect. And hopefully listeners will all start following you because your new um, adventure here with Jones is going to be a pretty fun one, I think. Oh, yeah. It's going to be handful. He's, he's awake now. I'm currently trying to keep him from chewing anything. So. Yeah. Oh, boy. He's awake. You better get him outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me today, Callie. I, I appreciate it and, and, and all your information and insight you shared with us. For sure, and thanks for having me. And um, let's make sure we hunt together this fall. For sure. For let's sure. do it. I, I would. I'm definitely gonna take you up on that. All right. Well, thank you, Courtney. Okay. Thanks. That. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something from the content, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on whichever platform you're listening from. Check out the show notes for links to references from this episode, as well as info on how to connect through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you're loving this podcast and want to support the production and content, please consider becoming one of my Patreon patrons. Being a patron connects us more on a personal level where I'm able to help answer questions and give advice. My husband William and I have bred, owned, and trained AKC Master Hunters, Field Champions, NAVDA VCs, and AKC show champions. We're excited to not only share what we've learned, but also listen from previous and future episode guests for additional content. Go to patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe and $5 per month and you're in. And as always, 2% goes to conservation. Until next week, bird dog babes, keep them versatile.